The jury said she murdered her husband with tainted Excedrin capsules. But now, could Stella Nickel be blaming her daughter for the killing? I think Stella wanted me to believe that Cindy killed Bruce to, because she couldn't have him, didn't want her mom to have him. It's a notorious case that takes a bizarre twist as evidence is destroyed. And Stella's daughter disappears with a quarter million dollars in insurance money. Then, take a special journey to a northwest town that nearly died. Well, that's what made me do this. You see, I had memories of this old town, and I loved this old town, and I didn't want to see it disappear. See how this lone pioneer single-handedly turned memories into a permanent landmark. Plus, watch as powerful and majestic Northwest Cougars roam this unique preserve and find out why they barely escaped death. Join your hosts, Brian Tracy and Penny Legate, tonight from the Arboretum. It's just a gorgeous day here at the Arboretum. Welcome to Evening Magazine, and if you'd like to have 10 grand in your pocket and a brand new red car to drive around, stay tuned. We'll tell you how both of those could be yours. I'd like to have both of those. So would I. But we can't. We're not eligible. <laughs> but you can, so stick around. But first, we have a story about Stella Nickel. You may remember her. Just about six years ago, she was convicted of murdering her husband with tainted Excedrin capsules. Now, even though she's behind bars today, there's a new twist to the story. A Northwest writer was recently allowed into the prison to do some exclusive interviews with Stella. And tonight, he tells us that Stella tried to convince him that her daughter may have been at least partly responsible for the murder. It was a year of medicating dangerously. It was 1986, and we didn't know if the capsules we took to relieve our pain would kill us instead. We did breathe a little easier when a jury convicted Stella Nickel of planting the poison in headache capsules that killed husband Bruce and random victim Sue Snow. But the uneasy feelings came back as we tried figuring out how Nickel went from housewife to deadly tamperer. Prosecutors said Nickel wanted her husband's insurance, but this man says the facts of the case are a lot more twisted. Greg Olson spent three years getting the only interviews Nickel has ever granted. His book, Bitter Almonds, the true story of mothers, daughters, and the Seattle cyanide murders, shows a woman part victim, part monster. Was she a monster? I actually liked her, which really surprised me because I had heard so many bad things about her that when I went down there, I was, I was, I was sort of afraid of her. You know, there was something there, that her press was so negative. But when I met her, I, I liked her. There was something vulnerable about her that I hadn't expected. But this isn't a story of whether Nickel is guilty of product tampering. A federal jury decided that five years ago. This is a story of a reclusive criminal mind, her troubled life, her bitter relationship with the daughter who sent her to prison, and former supporters now convinced she's guilty. Willie Stewart is Stella's niece and former supporter. I do believe she's guilty. Stewart didn't always believe that. She believed Durant was the victim of a hateful daughter out for a quarter million dollar reward and the victim of circumstantial evidence. Evidence like Durant's fingerprints on library books about poison. In a tape-recorded interview, Stella tells writer Greg Olson she read those books after coroners ruled her husband's death natural. I went and looked up the reactions, definitions, whatever you may want to call it, of cyanide in the encyclopedia. I looked up nicotine. I looked up emphysema because I wanted to know why all pathologists at the hospital got pulmonary emphysema mixed up with cyanide poisoning. Stella's daughter, Cynthia, was the prosecution's star witness, telling investigators about the library books and telling them of another book they'd never find, a diary, supposedly hiding her mother's secret plans of getting rid of her husband, that and a deadly cache of foxglove seeds to be put in his coffee. Willie Stewart thought Cynthia was lying at the time, but after the trial, she searched her aunt's belongings and allegedly found both items. The things you found, the diary, the seeds, what, what happened to them? I destroyed them. Why? 
because, um, you know, we're talking my aunt, you know, we're not talking about somebody down the road. And at the time I discovered him, we were, there was talk about an appeal. Uh, there was talk about possibly getting back into court. And when I found him, I didn't want anybody dragging me into court and forcing me to testify against my Aunt Stella. Olson says through it all, Stella sticks to the claim she is innocent, the victim of a bitter child who never got over a childhood beating. One that sent Cynthia to the hospital and Stella to jail. Cindy hated her mother. She was a competitor of her mother for men, for attention, for money, for everything. I don't think that was a loving relationship at all. Bother. The competition didn't, didn't stop there. Another reason she suggested was that Cindy was in love with uh, Stella's husband, Bruce. And when, that, when Bruce rebuffed her, um, she, I think Stella wanted me to believe that Cindy killed Bruce to, because she couldn't have him and didn't want her mom to have him. In those audio tapes, Stella deflects much of the responsibility for what has happened onto her daughter, Cynthia. But she never comes out and directly accuses Cynthia of being involved. I don't believe Aunt Stella is capable of betraying her own daughter because I don't believe Aunt Stella is a revengeful person. Now that's important because Stella hints at it a great deal in these audio tapes, saying her daughter knew more than the typical innocent bystander. Now Cynthia was never charged with a crime. Stella says the feds passed over her daughter and went straight for her. If they believed her and believed that to be the truth, she could just easily be gotten on conspiracy, an accomplice, mm -hmm. either before or after the fact. Yeah, then why didn't they? That's what you call plea bargaining. U.S. attorneys deny striking a deal with Cynthia. Stella calls it a miscarriage of justice robbing her of her life and rewarding her daughter with $250,000. Cynthia vanished with the money years ago, never to be seen again. Nothing about this case is simple, not even for the man who spent years piecing it together. One thing is clear, though. Stella won't be the heroine of this book. So is Stella Nickel the victim of the century? No, I think she's involved in this crime. I don't think she's innocent of the crime. It's a lurid tale filled with the stuff bestsellers are made of. Rivalry, hatred, betrayal, death, even destroyed relationships. Haley Snow knows all about destroyed mother-daughter relationships. Her mother, Sue Snow, was the other tampering victim. That's the really chilling aspect of this crime, is that you or I or anybody anywhere that uses a headache remedy could have been killed by Stella Nickel. Well, Greg told us just yesterday that a major network is planning on doing a movie based on his book. He couldn't say what big stars were going to play the lead roles, but he did say that filming is scheduled to begin this summer. Now, apparently the scriptwriters were having a real tough time trying to come up with just the right on-screen relationship between Stella and her daughter. But, believe it or not, it's kind of weird, but when they heard about the story about Tanya Harding and her mom, this all seemed to fit and make sense to them, and they mm -hmm. were able to finish the script. Kind of interesting, huh? Sure is. Now, stay with us, because a little bit later on the show, we're going to take you to an eastern Washington ghost town that almost disappeared. But up next, magnificent Northwest Cougars Roma Sanctuary you can visit.